Greetings. Welcome to Powell's Tales. I'm your host, Powell, where each week I will take you into the fascinating and sometimes dark and secretive world of the Hmong Hill Tribes. This is Powell's Tales, Hmong Stories, Myths, and Legends. Hit the subscribe button already if you're not a Hill Tribe member. Tune in each week. I appreciate your likes. Welcome back, tribal members. Today's tale, we're going to take you back to the early 90s. This is a time where Hmong people were quite naive, to say the least. In those days, we didn't know much better. I mean, it wasn't like we had an example. And there wasn't a whole lot of people volunteering a whole lot of information for us either. It's like... We were the path makers, if you will. Those who would break the trail. We made so many mistakes. There's a saying that when we came, the river was wild and vast and wide. And when you came, there was a freaking bridge. <laughs> I was told this many times by elders, of course. And it's true, they had it harder than I did, and I'm sure I have it harder than some. And I'm sure some have it harder than myself. But none had it harder than these four. These four guys in this story, they were poor. They didn't really have a whole lot. And, to be honest with you, they weren't the brightest... Let's just say they weren't going to be doctors and lawyers as the high expectations for many Hmong people during that time. Let's say maybe these guys were going to be factory workers or something else. Whatever the case, it was towards the end of summer, that time of the year when Washington State had a beacon for many folks. It was that... Time of the year for huckleberry harvesting again. And like I mentioned before, a beacon, a bright sun or star in the sky. Many flocked like they were heading to Mecca. And they came to these areas in Washington. Imagine a majestic peak, pristine, and areas where you look down and you are almost certain that you are the only or you have been the only human being that has stomped your foot here on this this place on this soil this earth that magic feeling just overwhelms you oh it's so beautiful look at those pristine evergreens standing tall majestic and proud wow take a second here and realize that this is also the land of the wolves. There are mountain lions here. There are rattlesnakes. And yes. There are whispers that the grizzly bear has returned to the northern Washington mountains. In this very area as a matter of fact. Where these cranberries and panberries and memberries and huckleberries and suckerberries. Whatever you chase in your life to get the richness. Like chasing a dream, never knowing danger, but always chasing one crop to another from grapes in the central San Joaquin Valley to apples in the Menachee Valley to the Yakima cherry trees. And now it was the huckleberries, but none knew that terror and danger lived up here also. For well, that, that is where the story begins. These four close friends, they, they were actually good people, despite what the elders may sometimes call them. And, of course, they didn't have a whole lot of encouragement from the entire Hmong community as well. They were, at the time, those 90s misfits, those ones that were struggling between that path of going down and that path of going up. With no one to guide us, some of us got lost. It was these four, in general, that they decided to come up to Washington State to chase that dream, to, to go pick huckleberries. Now, mind you, at this time, 
The year before, huckleberries were two hundred dollars a gallon. This year, it was almost three hundred. These little berries, one gallon of it, three hundred. Come on, you know I could pick at least five gallons a day. Five times a tray, fifteen hundred. Man, hey, we gotta go up to Washington, folks. And say what? Why are we gonna go to Washington, man? Let's go to Washington. They got money up there, man. We go pick up some huckleberries. And with that, they all decided to come to Washington. None really knew anyone here in Washington, but they knew of a guy who knew of a guy. So this friend, or this friend of a friend, if you will, had told them these stories basically filled their heads with these dreams and these gold digging ideas from the 1940s, if you, 1840s, 1740s, 1540s, 1440s, whenever there was some kind of rush, some kind of silver streak, some kind of gold chase, some kind of wonderlust, some kind of quick get rich scheme. But this wasn't a scheme. This was legitimate. If you actually put your back into it, if you actually invested the time and the effort to go out there and sweat and climb the, these beautiful hillsides and search for a raspberry and make sure you're keeping the head out before mountain lions and rattlesnakes and bears and never mind those other people out there that may rob you too. So... During all this, let's just say that first night was very welcome for them because they had a long, long day. And they quickly fell asleep. But they didn't really know that up here in Washington that old man winter never dies up here truly. I mean, he's in the crevices in the dark valleys. He's still breathing his cold breath. But it was okay, because one of these friends, let's call him Tom. Tom and, let's say, two. Those two, they were kind of like the brains of the bunch. Because Tom said, hey, man, what if we get cold? And two said, well, that's right, man. Let's go get your dad's, um, one of those, um, heater kerosene leader to heater that come on man you know what yeah i know what you mean so these two did get their father's kerosene heater and in the end i believe it's best to prepare for the cold but nothing nothing can substitute for the knowledge but at this time like i said our community, most of us, we were very naive. Just as we judge those before us and call them naive, I guess. Those after us would do the same to us. But let's understand that it may not be naive. May it just be unknowing. Ignorance, if you will. But no matter what it was, they fell asleep that night with that heater on, keeping them warm. And in the distance they could hear the night lark. They could hear tiny bits of pitter-patter as the rain tapped on their tent. Now, this part I ask that we take a second. And let's say that you are now there. You are these people. You have worked all day. You've climbed these elevations where the air is thin. You, you looked all over because you swear in the back of your head this big giant brown monster was going to just come at you with teeth and claw and maul you. So yes, while you're picking berries, you're also looking around. Not to mention that Hmong people, we know there's Bonzong and Bigfoot and Sasquatch and one of the two of the same Yeti, whatever out there. There's 
somebody out there, monsters. There's weird things we can't explain. So tonight, you worked your butt off, it's fair to say. And all day long, you've been mentally stressed out. You have so much anxiety. You're quite ready for the night. Now night comes to you, and you fall asleep. Just before you guys call it an evening. Before you retire into the land where the Sandman controls all. One of you pulls out a big fat blunt. Some cannabis. Illegal as heck back then, of course. But hey, one of you had it. So you guys pass it around. Hey, come on. It's good for you. It's medicine. It's herbal. After a long day's uh, hard work, it'll help you out. Smooth those sore muscles. True to its true intentions, that that joint just eased your mind, your body. You fell into a deep slumber. Sometime in the night, your bladder, your bladder no longer can be ignored. Pounds at your mind to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. You, you get up half asleep. You're just so tired. Your legs are so weak. You're so freaking tired. You open up the tent. Oh, God, it's so cold out there right now. No wonder the heater's on. Oh, it's so cold. You step outside. Uh, in consideration to to all your friends, you make sure that zipper zip again in that tent and you shut it. You find your way. Your eyes are starting to wake up. I mean, it's so dark out here. I can't hardly even see anything. Your feet leads you in the direction where you have designated earlier where you guys will all go and use as the restroom facilities. Now you find your way there. You don't know what's going on. You crouch down and one hand catches the ground so that you don't don't fall face first. And your entire body is so weak. You can't control it. There's this awful feeling in your head and your stomach. It feels like you're swallowed and a freeze or what is this at all? Oh. With one torrent of violent motion, all of your stomach contents come out. You throw up all over the ground around you. And what? Nothing really matters because everything is so dark. And you're so tired. Oh. Oh, you've got mucus coming out of your mouth and nose and your head. You pass out. You don't know how long or how much time has gone by. You wake up sometime and the, the morning light has begin to show itself far off into the distance, like an inclination of maybe daylight was on its way. You feel so cold. I mean, you're freezing cold. Oh, my God, you're so cold. Ah, oh, now, you're, now you're not in, in any, any, any hesitation to get back. You're actually walking fast, even though you're shivering and you're cold. Your body is very cold. Yes, it's the coldest you've ever been in your life. You laid out here exposed to the weather for hours. Holy mac, and you have this huge headache. You go back to the tent. Your hands barely operate. They almost seem to refuse to listen to you. Though they reluctantly open the zipper. You open the zipper only to smell this terrible smell of kerosene or gas, odd word, something nauseous. You look at your 
friend. And they're so peaceful. But none of them is waking up. You call out to them. One by one you touch them, shake them. One by one you find out this. And you discover they're not alive. That they have all succumbed to death. I was at a funeral home. I walked up to the sole survivor of that that expedition, if you will, the Huckleberry Venture. He was at the funeral home, and he was sitting with a friend of mine that I knew. I knew well. And these are his words as I walked up to him. I greeted him, and I gave him my condolences. I will try to paraphrase this as best I can in his wordings. Yeah, good looking out on that poor man. Good looking out, man. Man, I just tell you, oh man, I still feel I still feel weak. I ain't not a hundred percent, you know what I'm saying? But man, we was uh man, we was we was like we was, we was chilling down in Sacktown, right? And um, the homie said, let's go up to to Washington and make some money. And I was like, uh, how are we going to make some money? And this fool was talking about a one gallon of this 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 fruit, this little berry thing, was like $300. And, man, I was like, what? And he said, yeah, that carton of milk, that gallon of milk you got right in your hand, folks, that's, that's 300, that's three bills. If we pick some berries and fill it up with that. And I was like, what? You know, in a day, it feel like $10, folks, let's go. And so, like, the homies, we came up. And our first night, man, we was busting our ass, folks. I mean, we saw that some white people, they had some apparatus man it, it, it looked like it looked like a fourth thing right and and they was they was they was using this and so we asked the white dude hey will you buy that and he said man i'll give you one we're going home today and he gave us one of the little cranberry rakes that's what they used to pick them you know what i mean and we was like making a killing fool man we had like I myself, I had like 12 gallons full. I was busting it, you know. So that night we was ready to sleep. I mean, all I was dreaming about was, you know, 12 by 3, you know, 12 by tray. I mean, you do the math, man. I was thinking about these, you know, Dayton's and stuff. I was going to put on my, my, my load. So the homie passed out this, this J, right? He had this big old fat blunt. And I, I took a hit of that, that bud and I, man... My head started like getting real light, and I was ready to fall asleep. Boo! I mean, I was, man, P, I was hella tired, man. And so I knocked out, and then like maybe like try in the morning or something, man. I I don't even know, fool. I just I don't even know how you know how you got to go to the bathroom sometimes. You just go right, and I found myself out out outside, fool. And I was cold, man. I was cold. So I came back to where the tent was at, and I I, I, was, I opened the tent, and, and, and man, I coughed with the homies. I was like, hey, hey, homie, hey, hey, and I looked at the homies, and they 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 they, they lips was like kind of purple, fool, and I was like, what the? And then so I smelled it, was like kind of feel it smelled kind of weird, but then, and then I was like, oh, damn, oh, man. Anyway, the experts that later told me that. I was lucky I got out of there because I had to go pee because they said my entire body at that point was probably so full of carbon monoxide that I was probably dying right then. But the craziest shit though, P, that I normally sleep all through the night. When I heard this story, I was both saddened and astonished. I gave the man my condolence. And even to this day, I say, be careful when you're out there in those dark places. There's so many things that you got to watch out for. But remember, sometimes it's the littlest, littlest details that may kill us. And we shouldn't ridicule those 
who made mistakes that we may think are so, as we might believe, stupid. For rumors is that out in those foothills and those mountains, that sometimes when Hmong people go out there, they still hear awkward, weird voices. Kobe, go outside. Come to me. Until next time, thank you for tuning in and turning into Pals Tales. If you like, then go ahead and hit the like button. Subscribe if you want to. Thank you very much.